So pull, pull out what we had, what we were working on So, Ashley, what was the uh, the first theory? Yeah. So we've got three theories that would propose why uh, slavery started to disappear. Free wages, free wages, uh, free labor. How about examples of that that was talked about in the reading? <coughs> Yeah, that's probably the biggest one is um, uh, slaves take away jobs. Take away jobs from free workers. So and the best example I like to use is Abraham Lincoln as his campaigning for president. Uh, you can imagine, even there were people in the North who uh, maybe they disagreed with slavery, maybe they didn't. There was uh, undoubtedly some pro-slavery people in the North, but especially there were people who didn't want to go to war over it. Um, the issue that the United States was experiencing at that time was, well, as we're expanding westward, and this new territory is joining the U.S. as states, Right, like when Iowa became a state, when Nebraska became a state, there was a question, are they going to join as free states or slave states? And Lincoln ran on this platform that we do not want slavery to expand into those new territories. And his argument was, well, if you, let's say you live in Iowa or Illinois, but you're going to move to Nebraska, you want to start fresh out in Nebraska, well, what if it becomes a slave state? It's going to be harder for you to find a job if slavery is legal out there. And this free wages um, idea uh, was really like a capitalist idea, right? That it's a free market, um, and slavery ran contradictory to a free market. Uh, let's see, Wade, theory two. Morality, how about examples? Um... Enlightenment ideas kind of contradicted slavery. Here we got the Enlightenment. Did it talk much about Christianity? A little bit. And there, I don't. Yeah, I think it did briefly. Enlightenment. I don't know the Old slavery. Yeah, that's that's really a really good example. Uh, what's interesting is. Uh, like, think of America uh, during the 1800s. Very Christian, right? Um, probably say more Christian than it is today. Uh, obviously, there were Christian people in the South. But, you know, how can you be Christian in other slaves? You know, today, it seems pretty important to us. Uh, yeah, the Old Testament has references to slavery, and that's what slave owners would use to try to justify what they were doing. Like, um, in Frederick Douglass's narrative, he talks about remembering seeing a woman being whipped, and as the slave master's doing the whipping, he's quoting the Bible, quoting the Old Testament, that like, you know, a slave should obey the master. Now, if you ask like a Bible theologian today, they would probably say, well, you know, those references to slavery that are being made in the Old Testament, they're um, kind of like analogies that are being made, that because the people who lived back then would have been very familiar with slavery in their society. Right? You know, according, to, according to Exodus, then the Jews, or the Israelites, had just come from slavery in Egypt. So uh, slavery would have been something very tangible. Bible theologian would say, well, um, uh, the writers of the Bible were trying to say that you as a person should obey God 
like a slave obeys his master, and that would have been a connection for people. Not that it's justifying slavery, but you get to see the difference, um, how that works. Um, but yeah, that, that's a really good example. The, the Southerners, the pro-slavery folks, were, they were looking back at the Old Testament. Uh, a lot of the, the abolitionists were quoted the New Testament. Uh, you know, Christianity really was a driving force behind abolition. Many of them, the, the early abolitionists, were, were very devout Christians, and they just saw it as incompatible to Christianity. Uh, the last one I'll cover since uh, we're missing, since we are missing uh, Amber, uh, the actions of African Americans, uh, or Africans, because, you know, there's slavery beyond America. It talked a lot about, you know, the reading talked a lot about, like, the the experiences and the, kind of the first-hand knowledge that Africans brought. Um, you know, when, say, like, when Frederick Douglass went north after escaping slavery, or there were examples of, like, Equiano was a slave who, it was, he went to the uh, Great Britain after, after fleeing. Um, that they were able to give people their, their first-hand accounts. You know, when, when you hear, if you hear an account straight from a former slave's mouth, it's probably going to be pretty powerful, right? Like, you're going to think, man, that's what you had to endure. Um, that's going to play a big role. I'll, I'm going to try to tie this back into yesterday. Um, slave rebellions start to play a big role. Uh, the first big, the first successful one, really, the first really big one, successful one, was that Haitian rebellion, which we watched, um, we watched yesterday, um, and that's going to inspire a lot of others, and uh, it, it's going to become more and more difficult for these colonial powers to subdue them, and that's say that's another key factor in the the movement of abolition. So you want to pick up. Oh, where I was yesterday. That is Toussaint Louverture, who was the initial leader of the Haitian Rebellion. He ends up being captured, dies in captivity at the hands of the French. Uh, but the rebellion is going to continue, and in 1804, Haiti is going to uh, become independent. Now, also keep in mind, slavery is an issue in America, but it's probably even more of an issue in the Latin American countries. I think, and I, I don't like saying things off the top of my head, but this is, I think I've got this one pretty well memorized. Something along the lines of 12 million Africans were shipped across the Atlantic during the transatlantic slave, slave trade. Uh, only 2 billion of those will end up in America. The other 10 billion end up in Latin America. And that's where you're going to see probably more of those slave rebellions. Um, and you're going to see really a larger slave population. So like when you go to Haiti or the Dominican Republic today, or Jamaica is a really good example, they you know they look like black Africans because those the populations of those countries are almost entirely descendants of, of slaves who live there. Okay, uh, so I guess I threw this map in there uh, just so a point of reference. Uh, Haiti's right here. Uh, that island that it's on is Hispania. That was actually the island that Christopher Columbus landed on when he first came to America. Uh, it was named Hispania, which means to in Spain. That island is now divided today into Haiti and then the Dominican Republic. And then Jamaica is right there. Well, the populations of those islands are uh, pretty much all descendants of former slaves. Bahamas, too. The Bahamas have a lot of, of African ancestry. Cuba, which is right here, not so much, because Spain retains Cuba when most of its empire collapses. And uh, slavery will actually be legal in Cuba until, uh, I believe, the 1870s or 1880s. In fact, during the Civil War, there was talk among Southerners that, hey, 
let's try to get Cuba to join the United States, the, pro, or the, the Confederate States, I should say. Let's try to get Cuba to join the Confederate States. They'll, you know, they'll be on 